This is Amiable Arguments. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to Amiable Arguments. I am, as always, Luca, and I'm pleased to have another guest with me today, and this is John. So, John, thanks for thanks for coming in. Thanks for having this conversation. I feel like it's going to be a a difficult one. It's going to require care and tact and consideration, but I feel like it is a, a necessary conversation. And I think that I would be deeply hypocritical were I to neglect my duty to have this conversation when I've, you know, um, promoted so the values of free speech so openly on my podcast and that I feel that it's important to get all voices around the table. So, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be talking about race today. Uh, not a very easy subject to talk about in 21st Britain or in any place, really, <laughs> to be honest with you. It's still very much a, a tough conversation to have anywhere in the globe. But nonetheless, we feel the need to have this out. And so, yeah, John, what what's your feeling about race in Britain in the 21st <laughs> century? What, what, I, there's no way to ask that question, really. No. Is there in a, in a sort of just... You know, just rip the band-aid off. There you go. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you, Luca. It's a pleasure to be on your podcast. And um, I really think it's commendable that you're willing to have these conversations with people. I think the premise of amiable arguments is so important in an age where freedom of speech has never been more under threat. Um, and I think, for me, the importance of having these conversations, probably something that we have as common ground is that you can't get to the truth of something unless you hear all points of view. And one of the best ways to get to the truth is to hear different people vocalizing their perspectives and actually arguing and disagreeing and see where that disagreement goes. And that I've always found that that, whether it's listening to debates on, say, the question of religion versus atheism, thinking of people like Christopher Hitchens and Sam Harris, um, not that I would uh, sort of have the hubris to put myself anywhere near their intellectual um, level, um, but just that type of honest and open intellectual debate, I have found very valuable when forming my opinions about deep and important topics. Um, now, I would say, first of all, this is obviously a very controversial topic, and it's one that I think up front we both acknowledge that we're sort of walking through a minefield here. Um, I think to set the scene, it's probably uh, a good idea to kind of perhaps say, you know, where we're both coming from uh, on this. So just a bit of background. Um, Luca and I have had discussions on this topic before. Uh, we're both people who are interested in politics and philosophy and uh, this is one area in our conversations that we have had some disagreement. Um, so I suppose I could start with a bit of background for myself um, and then I can kind of say where I've ended up. So uh, rewind back to 2016. Um, I was not really someone who ever thought about race or gender issues or anything like that. I wasn't really politically. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, back then when I grew up, it really wasn't cool. Um, but I suppose where I'm coming from is I used to be a Guardian reading, Green Party voting, thinking, not really understanding what socialism was, but thinking it's probably a good idea. And if we could all just be a bit nicer, then that would probably be the way forward. And it was the events of 2016, Brexit, the election of Donald Trump, and then the arguments that happened on social media, in the culture at large, and how those arguments didn't resolve, that sparked my interest in politics. And that has taken me on a whirlwind journey over the years following. Um, I have read probably over 100 books at this point. I have listened to goodness knows how many hours of, of uh, online content, conversations and debates on YouTube. And I have come to rethink my position on a lot of issues, including some very controversial and very sensitive issues, um, including race. Now, the way we're kind of almost prevaricating around the bush there suggests that I have some sort of horrible eugenicist kind of 
policy that I want to bring. And it's it's nothing like that. I like your armband, by the way. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's the thing. I think it's it's a very difficult topic to broach because everyone's initial thought is that if you're interested in this, it's because you have some nefarious ulterior motive, even if you present yourself as coming from a good place. Um, I suppose the only way for people to actually find this out is to listen to what we end up saying um, and then just kind of decide for yourself. Do you think it is something that is, is immoral? Do you think it's bad? Do you think it's actually something that you agree with? Is it something you hadn't considered before that you hadn't heard about? Um, I won't tell anyone how they should think or what they should think, but I think as we actually start talking about this this subject after this extended preamble, um, perhaps there will be something that will be um, new and interesting for people. Fantastic. So I'm not going to be a, uh, a BBC presenter and tell you what you are, you know, whether it be, you know, this um, Labour or far right or whatever it is. So you, in your own words, tell me what you identify as, what your philosophy is, and then I will you know, come back at you. Right. Well, that's going to be tricky in the first uh, part of that, where I would find it difficult to identify with any particular political doctrine or philosophy at this point. I feel like the political philosophies that we've had, the politics espoused by our mainstream political parties, um, and probably most of the political philosophies that have come before have all failed to really encapsulate some of the major issues. And I don't feel like any one of those, you know, I'm, I wouldn't say I would support the Tory party. I wouldn't say that there's any political party that I would support. But on this particular topic, I'm someone who's come to the recognition that there are very important issues around race which do need to be discussed and do need to be faced and need to be addressed with honesty and bravery and without shying away from to borrow a phrase from uh, a left-wing activist on climate change inconvenient truths and this has led me to evaluate some of these issues and come to let's just say very different conclusions to those that are espoused commonly on social media whether it's the um, you know facebook um, whether it's something that you might hear just on on the mainstream media on the news um, if it's the sort of posts you see on LinkedIn, or if it's the sort of policies that you might be being uh, made to have training sessions on at work with your HR department teaching you about diversity, inclusivity, equality. Unconscious bias training, white privilege, all these sorts of things. Yes. So if you were to take a look at, at the news and the media and all of that and to kind of take their perspective on all of this it seems like the message we're being told basically is that white people are at fault white people are bad white people have done lots of bad things even if us in this generation haven't done anything people in the past did something did lots of very bad things uh, you might think of colonialism slavery and so forth and that this means that now there is this need for atonement that we have to acknowledge the bad things and take on board this responsibility and that we actually have to now make sacrifices to atone for this, if you like, original sin. Now, my disagreement with this um, is, is, is pretty strong at this point. Um, essentially, I, I see this as something that, on the face of it, I found ridiculous from the beginning, and I was kind of surprised to see it take off as much as it did over the last five or six years. In the first place, this worldview of white people bad takes a completely one-sided view of history, and it ignores all of the good things that white people, now by white I suppose you, you're thinking of Western civilization, you're thinking of Europe, you're thinking of Britain and our former colonial uh, empire, um, you know, Australia, New Zealand, America, Canada. What's strange, though, about this to me on a personal level is that um, I very much doubt our Victorian ancestors or whoever were building railways across Britain or, you know, ploughing the fields and doing it for, you know, for whiteness. 
for the glory of whiteness. No, absolutely. There wouldn't have been that. Yes, absolutely, racism was very, very prevalent. And I think that's certainly something that is very apparent with this country with the arrival of the Windrush generation. I've seen all sorts of videos of, you know, uh, people from Barbados or even the other side of the world from India with, you know, them trying to get a haircut in like 1950s London or 1960s London and they would just not be allowed into places. Obviously, we have that very famous no blacks, no dogs, no Irish. So I, I think that, but I think it's that othering, you know, that these are an other mm. and they have no place amongst us. And I think to sort of just raise a wire through our, you know, our a dispute with one another, this is where do other people of other races have a place amongst us? This is the crux. Is that a fair right. way well, to... Right. Well, that's really getting down to, to um, running, cutting right down to the bone, isn't it? Well, I feel that we have to because I feel like this is where the debate is and I think that's what's most worth people's time because mm. it's the most unique thing that they will get the chance to hear any of us say. Okay, well, let's let's have a stab at this. Um, so one way that you could think about this that, that might be new to you is to think about history uh, in a slightly different way. Now, we're always brought up usually thinking of history as, as uh, a linear line of progress where things are improving over time. Evolution is a process of things incrementally uh, getting better and more adaptive. And our society has been basically building on what the previous generation had come up with. Mm. We're improving things. Things are getting better. Now, there's another way of thinking about history, which is actually more of a cyclical model, where rather than everything is just getting better, there's actually more of a rise and fall. And so, for example, you can think about various civilizations in history, great civilizations, um, the Romans, the Greeks. Um, these are good examples where you can chart the rise of these civilizations and their sort of heyday and then their decline and eventual collapse. And so I think we have come to see ourselves in a, a, in a position of strength and that's come about partly from seeing history as a linear progression. But also possibly from the longevity of just simply how long England has existed. Well, with England specifically, yes. Uh, we've been a fairly homogenous country for the last thousand years, uh, ethnically speaking at least. Um, and so, yes, we've come to have a, a sense of security about all of that. Um, but, yeah, so perhaps what I would say, just to finish that thought, it could be that we're not on this journey of inevitable progress where we'll eventually end up in a Star Trek universe. It might actually be that we are at the peak, or perhaps we've even passed the peak, of a civilization in Western civilization, and that we may in fact now, as some uh, of the authors that I've actually read in the last few years uh, would argue, in a state of decline. Um, so I think this, if this is surprising, it's probably because most of us are used to thinking, well, technology is improving, therefore it seems like everything's improving. You know, films have got better graphics. You now have mobile phones and laptops and technology that was science fiction when we were children. And so we see that progress and everyone seems to kind of assume that maybe that applies to everything. If you actually look at society and you look at various ways of measuring the health of our society so whether this is rates of crime rates of divorce rates of single motherhood um, all sorts of things you could measure like that many of these things are actually getting worse and worse over time and have been um, over decades almost over almost a century at this point so for us to think um, do non-white people have a place in our society. I think the question that we'd need to ask ourselves is if we think about our society before when it was a purely homogenous society um, of English people, ethnically English people, um, as compared to now, have we seen that things are just, just as good? Um, are they better or are they actually worse? Now, I would argue that there are many important metrics many important issues that have become much worse since we have had 
mass immigration at an unprecedented scale. Now, when I say mass immigration, uh, again, this is another topic that I found that most people assume if you're interested in it, it's because you're a nasty, nasty racist bigot and there can't be any truth to it. Um, I remember having an argument with someone where at that time I had no racial, um, no sort of sense of well, <laughs> what, what am I what am I trying to say here what are you I, I wasn't <laughs> I wasn't interested in it but what I was arguing is I was trying to explain to someone who was saying that people who are interested in immigration and are opposed to immigration yes um I was trying to say that well what, what they were arguing is that if you were opposed to it you were basically a racist now what I was trying to say is well look there might be reasons that you're opposed to mass immigration that have nothing to do with race OK, so this could be, for example, that you're concerned about losing your job because there is now an influx of tens of thousands, millions of people. And they're now competing, perhaps in the particular industry and with a particular skill set that you have. They're competing for your job and that's making it harder for you to get work. And so because of that, you might not care what color this person is at all. But just the fact that these people are being brought in en masse and competing you with you for work is having a detrimental effect on your life. If you're one of those people, then obviously you're not a racist because race isn't part of the issue for you. Now, what I found trying to have this argument was that the person I was arguing with, um, who did seem to be quite sure of themselves, um, just flatly denied that this was possible. And they asserted that, no, they must be a racist. They are a racist. And it was just so bizarre for me because this was plainly uh, illogical and irrational and it, it just was not following logically that if that you could be a racist for being concerned about an issue when your concern had nothing to do with race and this is when I started to realize that actually a lot of the people who are making those accusations of oh you're a racist here there and everywhere actually that isn't always true because at that time I was being called a racist I knew I'm not a racist and so I knew that, wait a minute, this is, this is not true. Um, sorry, I've kind of lost my train of thought. No, that's quite all right. We, we can just carry on, on from there and pick it up. I'll, I'll come back at you on a few points. So I, I think really that, from my own point of view, look, we, we, we know that there are disingenuous actors out there. We, we absolutely know that. But the thing is, I don't really care what they think because I, I I'm and that's not the same as not caring because I disagree I'm more than happy I, I can care and disagree but it has to be because I know they're coming from a genuine place I have to know that they have good intentions towards my, myself primarily that they're not mm. trying to purposely trip me up um, and, and amongst other things so I think really that but on the question of uh, I'm 25 um, so I was born in 1996, Tony Blair came in 97. So all I've, for as long as I've been alive, I've only known mass immigration. And I had this argument with, uh, well, not argument, but I had this discussion with Migjan on uh, my immigration, immigration, immigration podcast that I did a few, few ago. And I was basically just saying that you're going to have a very hard time as the younger generation keeps coming trying to argue to them why this is on a, on an ethical level wrong mm. when you're, you're arguing that they should not like something that is the only thing they have ever known. Well, that's probably a good place for me to say something that might actually uh, might actually bring something new and interesting uh, to the audience because I, I feel like I've been talking a lot, but I haven't quite got got to what I really want to say. Um, it's a but, slow burn. Let's do it. It is. <laughs> Well, why should you care about race? Why should you care about immigration? Um, let's start with immigration. Well, one reason you should care about it is if you'd ever like to buy a house. Now, our parents' generation, a few, you know, a few mere decades ago, were able to buy houses and they were able to then start families and have children. They were able to buy owning property, not be having money just disappearing every month in rent. They were able to have space they were able to have a home in their own country, in their own homeland. Our generation are rapidly losing any hope of ever achieving that. For my generation, now I, I won't say what I do, but I earn 
fairly fairly good money by most people's standards. Um, I'm not wealthy, uh, but I, I do all right. For me, owning a two bedroom flat has become an aspirational dream. I mean, property prices in the last year in some parts of the Southeast have increased 10%. And the house of the house my parents bought 25 years ago for less than 200 grand is now um, worth more than 1.4 million pounds. And how we're expected to ever own our own property um, at this point, it, it seems completely unrealistic. Now, what has this got to do with immigration? Well, Economics 101, what determines the price of something? It's supply and demand. The more you have of something, the more supply there is, the less demand there's going to be because there's more to go around. If you have scarcity, um, that can make something more valuable. Now, what's happened with mass immigration, the population of this country has increased from around 50 million to over 70 million in just a few decades. Now, that is a massive increase in demand for houses. Now, you might think, well, our population's just growing, but it's not as simple as that. The truth is, the population of the indigenous white British has actually remained fairly stable. And in, in fact, if anything, we're starting to decline because if you look at the breakdown by age, we're very top heavy. A large proportion of our population are very elderly and they are soon to be dying off. Um, the increase in our population has come about uh, mostly through two factors. One of these is immigration of new people coming here. The other is the fact that the people who come here have higher fertility rates, which means the average woman has many more children than the indigenous white population. So more people have been coming, but also they have been increasing as a demographic relative to the indigenous population. That is where the population growth has come from. And that is why you are going to struggle to ever afford any kind of property. Now, that is a perfectly reasonable thing for you to be upset about. The fact that the previous generations have made changes to the country that you have as your home, such that you can't even have a home and you can't even start a family. And why can't we complain about this? Why can't we actually talk about this? Because most people will probably have never heard those dots joined up as to actually why house prices are going up. You might think, well, a lot of it's to do with investment from Russian oligarchs and so forth. And yes, that's in London. That's that's a part of it. But it's by no means... But they're not buying up houses in Bradford, are they? The Russian oligarchs. Exactly. And, and like, a lot of people might not know just how far this has gone. I mean, in London, white people have not been half even of the population for some time. But in many other major cities around the country, this is also the case. We are becoming minorities in our own homelands. So... Being able to buy property is the first reason that is perfectly legitimate for people to be upset about. The reason it's difficult to actually join those dots is because if you do, what people on the left will do is they will say, ah, it must be because you're a racist and you hate brown people. Now, obviously, that's not true. You want to buy property. It's fair enough if you're upset that you can't buy property. But they will just attack you for being a racist. Why will they do that? Well, it furthers their political agenda and it gives them virtue signaling points because they're now the good righteous person who is condemning you as an evil, nasty racist. And so that's why this issue doesn't get spoken, uh, discussed. Um, and the problem is if you don't talk about an issue, if you can't actually say what the problem is, you can't solve it. And that's why we haven't found a solution to this problem and house prices just keeping, keep going up and up and up and further and further out of your reach. OK, so I, I, I agree, generally speaking, you know, that I, I think we largely agree that mass immigration has enormously damaged the country. But I think where we differ is our our concern for the racial components of, of that society. You obviously, well, and I shouldn't speak for you, but from my own point of view, uh, go, going back to what I said about growing up when I was, you know, just a young boy, I, I remember living in... I, You never really thought about it as a kid. I um, I had a fantastic doctor from, and who obviously from of Indian origin, and my best friend at school um, was a young lad who came over from Pakistan, 
And I just remembered not... It didn't matter. They were just nice people. And they were doing nice things for me and I was doing nice things for them. And I think that as long... I think that race is just a small part of the character of a country. And, I mean, no one would say... I mean, I suppose you could argue that America is less American since the colonists arrived in the uh, in the 1500s. But, uh, you know, I think broadly speaking, we'd still, uh, you know, certainly since, you, you know, so I, I think that the, the idea and the culture and the character of a country are, are the most important things about it over its racial aspect. And because I believe fundamentally that any human being, regardless of skin colour, can adopt those aspects you can I, I not in a sort of identify as sort of way but not in a i can will myself into it but i think that there is a point when if you want to have um if you have been born into a, a country as is the case here with a lot of the uh you know minority groups they've it wasn't their choice to be here it was a grandparent's choice to be here or whatever it is. And this is the only home that they have ever known. And it's the only home they'll probably ever know, just like me. And so I think really that the the best thing we can do, and I feel like the most realistic thing, is that as long as the character of a country can be preserved, I, I'm, I don't care about the racial component, really. Hmm. Well, I think that's probably somewhere that we disagree but I think the important thing is why now I just want to I feel like I have to say at this point I don't go around with a massive chip on my shoulders just seeing non-white people and just thinking oh I hate them it's 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 not that at all it's not a question of individuals um you know it's it's the old the old chestnut but you know I have had and I have many friends who are not ethnically English who are not quote-unquote white um, they would say that proves nothing. Of course they would. Of course they would. But it, it's still worth saying because even though they say it proves nothing, I think it's still important uh, because it shows that you you don't just have a blind, vitriolic, um, xenophobic hatred of, of other people. Um, it's actually something that is a lot more considered and and nuanced and it's not about hating people. What it's about for me is, I suppose, a question of identity and of what we value. Now, what you will see championed in the media and and the you know the news and in um, films is is diversity and identity and the championing of identities. Now, which identities are championed? It's non-white racial identities, and it's non-heterosexual sexual orientations and other identities like that uh, so being transgender for example those are cultural or racial identities which are championed and celebrated it's good for people to have a positive identity um, including their race and their national heritage now i'm not completely opposed to that on the on the racial side um, i think identifying with your sexuality is I mean that's a subject for another uh, another discussion another time. Yeah, uh, so it I, doesn't really factor into what we're no, discussing No, it's, it's here. not what we're here to discuss. Um, but I, I, I would I would just say that the thing that should be perfectly obvious to anyone kind of just taking a sober look at this is that there is a double standard here because who is the one group who are not allowed to have a positive identity about their race? It's white people. Now. When we ask why that is, they will come at you with, oh, well, slavery, colonialism and white supremacy. You are bound by this original sin and you have to atone for it and you have to sacrifice for it. Now, again, this is something that I don't think is being done in good faith. I don't think this is virtuous. I don't think that this is right. I think it's wrong. I think it's demeaning. And... At scale, I think it is tantamount to emotional and racial abuse against white people. Now, why would I say that? Um, apart from the fact that it is completely demeaning to white people and it's designed to subjugate them and to shut them up, 
in, in, in the context of a discussion, when those tax, tactics are deployed, the idea is they don't want to have the argument. They want to make the other person forfeit the argument by being disqualified from it. So if they can just convince people that, oh, no, they're a nasty racist, they don't actually have to talk about it. Now, if you were to take that move off the table, the other person might start saying, well, what about some of the good things that white people have done in history? And how does that balance out? What about the fact that, say, oh, you hate the British Empire for slavery, but did you know that it was actually the British Empire who abolished not only slavery, but the slave trade with the Royal Navy going out, going after slaving ships? Did you know that countries other than Britain and European countries actually had sometimes much larger slave trades, the Islamic slave trade, for example. Now, this is a clear double standard because nobody ever talks about the Islamic slave trade. Nobody is asking parts of the current Islamic world to make reparations for their slave trade as they are for as they are doing with white countries. I, I think there's something further to explore in that, though, which is that w we know deep down that even if, say, for example, tomorrow for whatever reason, um, maybe he had a hell of a hangover. Boris Johnson did decide to say, hey, Saudi Arabia, apologize for your slave trade. We'd all know deep down that that would be a stupid thing to do because we, we accept that Saudi Arabia wouldn't feel the moral guilt of it. And that's that, a very that, interesting that, that, that point. Wouldn't, you, you know you would be wasting your time because you know deep down they wouldn't even extend an olive branch and say yes you're right they, they wouldn't behave like we do <laughs> no they tell you to do one yes they would tell you to do one <laughs> they would absolutely tell you to do one uh, i'm not going to argue whether or not they'd be right to tell you to do one but if we have to do it then yeah. yes i understand that but what i fail to understand is why the way that I see what's going on right now with the wokeness and all these sorts of things, I'm not a particularly, um, I'm not a Hegelian, but I think that there is a bit of a Hegelian dialectic going on here where the, there has once been a great injustice done by one particular people to another. Not to say that others haven't done these things, of course, but we don't live in those parts of the world. We live in this one. And so we're forced to deal with the personal things that get leveled against us because of our own values, Western values, such as tolerance and courtesy and all of these sorts of things. I would have to challenge you there because I would not agree that tolerance is a Western value. I'd say that that's actually a superimposed value that we're, we're told now, oh, tolerance is a Western value. I don't agree that it was historically. I do. I do think tolerance has historically been a Western value, and I think that this is the most... Um, you could argue it's the most um, easy to show in religious toleration during the time after the settlement of you know Westphalia and the religious wars that rattled on over the 1600s. When you read Voltaire, he talks about just the absolute glorious nature of what he sees at the London docks in the 1720s, where he can see the Protestant and the and the Catholic and and the Jew all trading together you know, harmoniously, for, you know, in very much Adam Smith's invisible hand sort of way, and how Voltaire deeply envies that, that it, it would be something that France would later get, but at that time it didn't have. Mm. And so that, that idea that permeated by John Locke's, you know, view on essay on religious toleration had a butterfly effect that I think gradually has permeated throughout the European continent as well. So I think maybe not tolerance in all things, but I do still think that tolerance has been, is not just some retroactive thing or something that's just been placed on us recently. I do believe it has roots. Uh, perhaps what I'm reacting to is the way that uh, tolerance is used uh, these days. Uh, I think it's used in a different way perhaps than it was before. Um, but I think getting back to what we were what we were talking about with the, the kind of the double standard. Um, I think another example is that, um, you know, these original sins of white Western people, slavery being the most notable. Um, it's commonly talked about that, you know, lots of Africans were sold and 
shipped over to the American colonies and other colonies. Um, what's not commonly spoken of is the fact that those African slaves were not enslaved by white people. They were actually enslaved by other African tribes. They went and enslaved their fellow black people and they sold them to the whites in exchange for guns and other things. So there's no apparent guilt for the people who actually enslaved these Africans originally. And I think that's something to think about. Well, why is that? Because if what we were interested in is establishing where does the guilt for slavery, say in America, for example, where does that guilt lie? Well, part of it lies in the fact that the African countries from whence the slaves were taken enslaved other Africans and sold them as slaves. If you're going to completely wipe that of, of any uh, culpability and you're not going to acknowledge the guilt there, then you're not interested in having an honest intellectual discussion around where the guilt lies. What you're actually doing, and I, what I would argue the people who push this narrative are actually doing, is they are using this to try to frame an attack specifically against white people to demean us and to make us feel guilty. Um, and that's actually part of uh, a much what much broader and more sinister agenda. And so really, I think this is the crux of... the. You're saying it's a race war. Um, in, in, an almost Cold War, a Cold war. type of that's a good way proxy of... race war. It's a subversive race war. It's not a. It's not about getting out there, grabbing the gun or anything, and you know, smashing two armies against one another. But it is a war nonetheless. Is that? Um, I just I worry that for a lot of people listening to this. Um, this just might sound like nonsense. So I'm just trying to think of a way to actually perhaps ground this in the reality of what's happening. So if you think about the changes that are happening in our society, the population has massively increased. We now have 20 million people who are not ethnically British, who are not genetically part of our people, as it were, who have come to this country um, since the end of the Second World War, essentially. Now, is that a problem? Why should that be a problem? Why should we care about that? Well, the problems that that creates for us, and I've just articulated the problem of being able to buy a house in your own homeland, I'd say that's a significant problem. I think that's fair enough for people to worry about. Um, but there are other aspects to the changing demographics which I think are significant and which I think most people aren't worried about simply because they never hear these issues discussed. And that's because if they get discussed anywhere, the person discussing them is instantly attacked for being a racist. So one example of this is the fact that we ostensibly live in a democracy. Now, in a democracy, at least in theory, what happens is that the people vote for the representative politicians, the MPs, that they prefer. Those who get the most votes end up forming the government um, and that's how we have the fairest system possible. Now, if there is a conflict of interests between different groups within a country, that is going to manifest in the results of democratic elections. And a really good example of this was the mayoral election in London of Sadiq Khan. Now, there's a great YouTube channel called The Academic Agent, and he has actually gone and um, done some analysis on these results. And what he found is that if you overlay a heat map of who voted for Sadiq Khan versus the other candidate in that election, and you superimpose that onto a heat map of the more um, uh, diverse boroughs of London, if you look at basically where there was the largest number of non-white, uh, non-ethnically British people, they're the same map. And so what that revealed is that the non-white people were voting based on the race of the person who then was elected. And why were they elected? Because ethnically British people are not even half of the population of London. Now, in London, what that means is that if there is any conflict of interest between the white British and immigrants who are of some other descent we will never be able to vote in our own best interests because we simply don't have the numbers. We are de facto politically disenfranchised in our own capital city. And 
you only have to extrapolate that to what happens across the country if we get to a point where we are no longer even 50% of the country. Now, most people might not know this, and I'll just finish this, th this thought, Luca, and then I'll let you come in. Please. Um, it is projected that by 2066, in a few decades, we will no longer be even 50% of the population of our own homeland. There are now more Muslims living in Britain than there are Welsh people. This should startle you. The reason it probably doesn't is because, again, you've probably not heard any of these issues being talked about with the sort of urgency that you would expect if they were actually an existential threat, which is what I would uh, suggest that if you really consider them and their implications, that is what they present um, to all of us who would call Britain our homeland and who are ethnically British. So first, I will just say that um, I, I feel like there is a little bit of pushback I could possibly give as regards to the Sadiq Khan thing, which is that um, Sean Bailey, the conservative um, candidate, was also not white. So how wh how can the race of one particular prove one if the other candidate is also not white? Well, that's a good point. I think probably the conservatives are more seen as as the 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 most the party that is most likely to be accused of racism, even though in this day and age the idea of accusing them of racism, I find ridiculous. Um, but Labour have become because Labour, of course, used to be the party of the working man of the what would have been the white working class British male. Sure, they have in recent years completely flipped. They're now the party that demonises the white working class male, and instead they are the party that champions um, non-white racial identity politics and of course the identity politics of um, non-heterosexual sexual identities. Um, so what I would say uh, just to the Sean Bailey point is they would probably see Sean Bailey as probably like the token black person in what they see broadly as a white identitarian party even though I, I would argue that that is nowhere near the case and um, no not would I but so do you think that they just see more authenticity in Sadiq Khan? I think they see him as coming from the political party that best serves their interests. He's Labour. The Labour Party serve the interests of the immigrant they champion. Of minorities. Yes. Yes. Right. OK. But OK, so this but this is a thing that gets me and it sort of goes back to the we have an in, we, we have a lot of people who are obviously not ethnically British here that have become very successful politicians. Well, I say very successful, I mean, you see them around a lot, of course, um, such as, you know, Diane Abbott or Don, Don Butler. And although, of course, I find these people, their politics highly divisive and dangerous and difficult, I don't think it's a be all and end all because I think for every Don Butler you have, you also have a Majid Nawaz. For every uh, Diane Abbott you have, you also have a Constantin Kissin. And I think that, you know, Majid and um, Constantin and people like that who were not, you know, ethnically from here, they still, you can tell that their heart is in the service of Britain. And the preservation of Britain, of, of protecting its people, of protecting its borders, of, you know, individual freedoms and liberties long held over a thousand years that have been passed down from generation to generation. I think they understand these things. Well, let me ask you a question, Luca. What is Britain and what is its significance? And and <sighs> just to just to kind of so what I'm getting at is are you talking about a landmass? Because if you're just talking about a landmass, that has no meaning to I'm anyone. I'm talking about spirit. Well, what I is think... the spirit of Britain if not... Because the way you're talking about Britain is the way that you would... It, I, it, it feels to me like what you're getting at is Britain as a nation. Mm -hmm. Now, a nation is made up of people. Um, the etymological root of that, natio... Um, you know, it's, it, it all goes back to actually a people, an ethnos, an ethnic group, which includes genetics. It includes race. Um, it includes, by which I mean, you are all of the same people. Um, so, I mean, genetically, if you were to... I know there, there's a lot of people trying to say that, you know, actually we're all kind of more genetically similar than we are different. Um, 
and I think there's a lot of pseudoscience out there. Genetically speaking, um, you or I would be more genetically related to the average English person than we would to, say, a random French person. And we would be more distantly related to an average, um, say, Chinese person or African, because they are significantly different to us. Um, now, why does why does that matter? Um, that the, was my next question. Well, well, <laughs> well yes, it, it matters because again, what we're coming what we're we're coming back to here is the question of identity. Who are we, and what does it mean to be a nation? What does it mean to be a people? So, if you think about who who we care about and why in our lives. You could think about this as a set of concentric circles. So at the center, there's you. And, you know, whether that includes uh, your, you know, your spirit or your phys physicality, there's, there's you at the middle of, of, of this circle. The next circle out would be your immediate family. These are people who share 50% of your DNA. So I'm talking about your mum and dad, uh, any brothers or sisters, and any sons or daughters. This is your immediate close kin and genetically speaking from a darwinian point of view you care about them because they are very very closely genetically related to people i, I uh, don't ge genetically related to you understand though because i've never once in my life have i really i mean th okay that's not true let me rephrase that i don't feel an affinity and love for my parents and perhaps i have unique circumstances in this case i grant which i'm not going to go into on the podcast but i care far more about the love and the tension and the time and the generosity and all of these sorts of things if i were to write a list of things that mattered to me about my my parents i would be surprised if my genetic closeness to them break broke the top 50. i just i don't know if it's a very Hmm. I don't, you know, it just feels like, I don't think that's how people, I, I it, it feels very rational and empiric, you know, very rational, but I don't think it's how people think about their families on a daily basis. I, I would agree. I don't think it's people actually think about it in these terms, but uh, in terms of your, you know, okay, so historically speaking, it has mattered to men a great deal that their wife didn't cheat on them. Why? Because it matters that your child is actually your child and not someone else's child. Now, if you're in a situation where you end up having a child with someone and then the relationship doesn't work out, you're expected to pay child maintenance for this child. However, if there's a DNA test and they find out it's not your child, then you're off the hook. Well, why? because it's not your child. You're responsible for your child. The fact that that child is genetically related to you is what makes it your child. And that's why people, you know, love their, people love their children and they put their terrible drawings on the fridge and they put up with all, I mean, I'm a father, I, 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 I know this firsthand. Um, you put up with things from your child that you wouldn't put up with from anyone else because you <laughs> love them and because you see yourself reflected in them. I mean, that's one of the most magical things about becoming a parent is that you see your your face, you see your yourself and, and your extended family reflected in this child who is a continuation of, of you and your family. Um, and that's, that's a really important part of your bond and your connection with that child. And by extension, that is part of the bond that we have with our with our family and our extended family. And, and sort of where I'm going with this is that you can extend that out to you have friends. And actually, there are studies that show that people's friends tend to be more genetically related to them um, than the average person. Um, you would have your community, you know, the people you live around and over generations, you would end up being more closely genetically related to them. Um, you know, you, you can notice across the country, there are actually variations. If you really pay attention, there are variations to how people look in Scotland, to how people look in Ireland. You know, there are there are differences that that arise over time. So what I'm saying is that your your genetics, your genetic identity is a is a fundamental and significant and important and valuable part of your identity. And I'm not just talking about white people, for black people too. It's it's who you are. And it determines everything about you. Um, you know, if if something goes wrong with your 
DNA, it can cause cancer. Everything that is unique and special and valuable about you as a human being is determined fundamentally, the raw material, by your genetics. Now, of course, there's, there's all the, there's, you can get into the nature-nurture discussion, um, and it's not just your genetics, that's how you live for your life. Um, but the point is, it's a fundamental part of your identity. And the identity of a nation, of a people, of an ethnic group, is inseparable from genetics. And bringing this back to the kind of discussion that we're having, hmm. um, if you replace the people in a country, that country will not be the same country, because if by country you mean nation, then it will not, because it will not be the same people. If you, it, Japan is a good example, because Japan is, is still virtually ethnically homogenous, and they have a very distinctive um, sort of physiognomy. You can see they're very distinctive in, in how they look. Um, if you were to imagine Japan over 50 years having the same levels of mass immigration that we've experienced and becoming 60%, 40%, 20%. At a certain point, it's not Japan anymore because there are different people who don't share the same heritage. They don't share the same culture because that culture has changed by virtue of the fact that the people who come there bring their own culture. Um, it's They don't have the same identity. They don't have the same appearance. That There are different people. And it's not to say that they're better or worse. It's to say they're not the same. It's a different identity. It's a different people. And in a sense, I suppose I could make the argument that I champion diversity more than anyone on the left because I actually value the different ethnic identities, whether it's the British, within which you've got, say, the Scottish, the Irish, the Welsh, um, or the European identities, but also in Africa or in China or in all other parts of the world. I wouldn't want to see Africans replaced in their homelands, but Africa is many, 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 many times the size of this country. I don't think we should go around colonizing other people's countries, but I don't think it's fair that we should have to have our homeland and our sovereign territory taken away from us just because that suits the political agendas of people on the left. Okay. So I think the thing that I, I have to preface here is that obviously in an ideal world, if I could just turn the tap off right now and end mass immigration, I obviously would. That's well, not... that's interesting because that shows that you do care about the same issues. I care about it because I care about the rate Okay. I care about the rate. I'm I'm deeply concerned that because of the absolute pace, mm -hmm. for want of a better way to put it, that people have. I'm I'm concerned about the speed, and I'm concerned that we're continuing to let three hundred thousand people in a year when we can barely get on top of. You know, I I think in small burst it is it is quite easy to assimilate. We have many examples of assimilation over the course of British history, but that was done in small, bur bur small bursts. Mm. Um, I also think, though, that given that that is, um, for want of a better way to put it, impossible, neither mainstream parties show any current notion by way that they will end it anytime soon. The Conservatives provide lip service, of course, but not much more than that. I think that there are... Uh, I think that there are just practical things that we can do about this, which includes making people, uh, you know, it's like what David Starkey says, you know, there, there are there are people that they, they want to find their roots in Britain. And we can see this with, oddly enough, the thing that got us onto all of this with the uh, the views of uh, d d different races in um, in film and uh, t television and um, advertising and all these sorts of things, a, a necessity to belong. And I wouldn't want to deprive anyone of that to some degree. I care deeply about us having a place to belong. But as I'd already said, I um, 
most people now living here will be second, third generation. It wasn't their choice to be here. And so I'm not in favour of treating them like second class citizens over something that they had no option over. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't their choice. Um, I've met many uh, remarkable people since I've, I've moved here to London. I don't disagree with the politics of London which I genuinely think I could put into some sort of big monolith of politic, <laughs> of political thought. Um, but I just, I think that given that we can't see a change to this anytime soon, I, I think that the most, um, for, for example, I, I think this is the clearest way that I can do it. It is not necessary to uh, think of the Lord of the Rings example the amazon tv series mm -hmm. it's the most lazy haphazard way to implement diversity that i've ever seen obviously when tolkien was writing the great lord of the rings he wasn't thinking about things like representation and all this sort of stuff well he didn't need to because at that point this was an ethnically homogenous country I grant. And, and what you're talking about there is really interesting when you say implementing diversity this is being forced on us this is all completely artificial and unnatural what you've seen in the last few years where advertising has suddenly become, and, and this is completely in disproportion to the p percentage of non-white immigrants to the country. I know. Almost every other person you'll see in an advert is non-white. Almost every couple that you see in an advert is mixed race. This is being pushed as deliberate propaganda to try to normalize this because it's not normal. It's actually a historical... Uh, it's it's unprecedented in history, um, and it's it's actually being done against our will, and we were never asked. I mean, this is the point. If you look at every survey that has ever been carried out yes. about immigration, the overwhelming majority of the British population have always been against it, and yet our politicians have done it against our will. They've forced this on us, and now we can't afford to buy houses, and we've not even got onto some of the big problems that this causes. Now... Rotherham. What, what, what comes up for people when I say the word Rotherham? Are most people aware that there are, and I'm not just saying this, this is the result of an independent inquiry, there have been organised gangs, predominantly made up of Pakistani Muslim males, predating deliberately on white young girls, children, and there have been organised rape gangs carrying on for decades and this has been ignored and covered up this if you evaluate it honestly can only be described as a racist hate crime against white people by the muslim immigrants who we so generously invited into this country or rather who were forced on us against our will and this has happened in in countless towns and cities Across the north, I know people who have been involved with dealing with the victims of this horrific crime. Um, this is something that's been forced on us, not to mention just regular knife crime in London. It's, it's, it's something that we seem to have got used to now, that crime rates have gone up. It didn't used to be like this. I myself got into a fight only a few months ago where I was assailed completely unprovoked by some random drunk black guy who just decided i was walking in town late at night with some friends he just decided he didn't like the look of me so he was verbally berating me he was being threatening for all i knew he could have had a knife now fortunately i'm six foot one and i can handle myself so when he came and attacked me i punched him in the face and knocked him on the ground most people probably wouldn't have been able to handle that situation and i was lucky because i could have been stabbed for all i knew he could have been better at fighting um, you know, this is this is a real problem in the lives of, of an increasing number of people who are coming face to face with what diversity actually means for this country. Um, and I think it's if you look at it on net balance, mass immigration has been a net negative for this country. The cost is paid by the indigenous white people. And I don't think it's fair that we pay that cost for, you know, Partly because we were never asked. Again, we were never, um, we never said we wanted this. This was forced on us. 
Um, and partly because we don't owe it to anyone. We don't owe it to them, certainly not our generation, even if you want to bring up things, bad things that happened in the past, like slavery, because you can bring up bad things that all countries have done to others. All races have blood on their hands historically, if you want to play that game. And so I don't think that we should give in to this view that white people are the bad guys and we have to atone. I think that's anti-white racism. I think it's evil. I think it's tantamount to emotional and psychological abuse. And I think that if we don't actually address these issues and their implications, the political disenfranchisement, what happens if all of these problems continue to get worse? And again, there's like so many things we could have talked about that we, we didn't even get to. Um, I think us and future generations are going to pay the price for it. It's a very strong thesis. But um, I, I do still, just because we are currently living in an overcorrection, no ideology holds the reins of power forever. Um, I think that there are a few instances, not many, I grant uh, things, generally speaking, do look bad. But I do think that there is a pendulum and every action has its equal opposite reaction. And I do think that we can, through dialogue, through getting... And I, I think dialogue is the most important thing here. I think it just means it means talking across the board. I don't want to sound like some sort of airy-fairy, wishful thinking, you know, socialist on this thing. I really don't. But I do think that the more that you can encourage people to speak across these divides, the better chance we have of getting out on top of this thing as a whole. I don't think this can be a conversation that can only be have be had amongst the indigenous population. Well, you're it, not going to have a conversation with Pakistani Muslims about the rape gangs because they're just not no, going to say, oh, actually, sorry about that. We'll, we'll, we'll cut that out. We'll pack that in. No, no. Sorry. I, I, no, there are, there are people who are irredeemable. The, absolutely. But no one's going to do anything about it. No. No, we're not. But people do... Unless we decide to. Unless we decide, actually, no, we don't have to go around hanging our heads in shame, beholden to these people in academia and on the news who tell us how evil we are, whether it's Robin D'Angelo talking about white fragility, if you've heard of her from America, nasty piece of work. We could decide, actually, you know what, we don't have to go around feeling shameful for things that have happened in the past. And actually, it's okay for us to be proud of the countless achievements and contributions to humanity and society that white people have contributed and come up with. And actually, it's okay for us to lay claim to our own sovereign homeland and to secure that for our children, rather than having it just taken away by random people who've been imported against our will, don't care about us, and certainly are not going to decide to just pack up and leave because we have a dialogue and say, actually, sorry, would you mind awfully? It's getting rather cramped here. I think the only thing that is preventing us is the fact that we have been conditioned probably our whole lives to feel bad for thinking in these terms, to feel like we're a bad person if we actually think of standing up for ourselves. And I think it's high time that we reflect on this ourselves. And I know that for myself, it's been a very... Um, challenging moral and emotional journey to come out of that psychological conditioning to get to a point where I actually feel like, no, it's it's okay for me, it's for us to stand up for ourselves. And in actual fact, it's our duty, not just for ourselves, but for our people and for future generations that we have a duty to make sure that they don't just not exist because of bad things happening in our generation. Our grandparents and great-grandparents went to war and fought and died to secure this country. Now, whatever you think about those wars, I think they were tragic. But they fought for something. That is meaningful and powerful and transcendent. It transcends time. They were thinking of future generations. And ultimately, you are the, 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 the living 
end of an unbroken chain of successful survival and reproduction dating back to the beginning of life on Earth, don't be the weak link. You know, our generation should not give up just because the problem seems insurmountable. I think dialogue is right, but I think dialogue can only happen between people of different political dispositions who are within our own people. I think if we are to stand up for ourselves and to advocate in our own interests, well, people where that creates a conflict of interests aren't going to get on board with that. Now, if they want to come along for the ride and support us, fantastic. But I think primarily we have to be thinking in terms of what is in our best interests, our being us, we, the indigenous ethnic peoples of these islands who would prefer not to be reduced to minority status. Well, fantastic. We, we have run out of time there, ladies and gentlemen. I, um, I hope that this conversation has been unique. I hope it's been something that has given you food for thought. I hope that we've both given you some, we've both provided something of offer here that will give you some cause for reflection. I obviously welcome, as I said, anyone with any views on this podcast, and I hope this pod, this particular episode proves that I'm not just fluff and that I do actually mean what I say. And so I welcome any and all feedback, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you once again to Arena for the fabulous artwork that she provides for the podcast. And until the next one, take care of yourselves, folks. <laughs>